Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Comfort Verses in Context. Last week, we asked the question, What is the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees? Now, before we look into that, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can look into your word tonight. We pray, Father God, that your spirit of wisdom and revelation would illumine the eyes of our understanding to help us see that there is a righteousness that is intended for Israel that would exceed the righteousness of the law, which is the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And in the same way, for us Gentiles, there is a righteousness without law that is meant for us. Tonight, Father, as we rightly divide your word, we pray, Father God, that your spirit will guide us into all the truth and help us to see the things you want us to say and the truths that we receive from your word this evening. Let it simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So again, we ask the question, what is the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees? Now, just a little review as we begin our study tonight. Now, the pericope in consideration, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 to 48, is part of a greater pericope known as the Sermon on the Mount, which spans from Matthew chapters 5 up to chapter 7. Now, we have determined that the Sermon on the Mount is spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a minister of the circumcision to his disciples specifically, and to the multitudes of Israel generally. Now again, as we have said in many broadcasts, don't take our word for it, but let us show you from the scriptures that it is the Lord Jesus who is talking in this pericope. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, we read Matthew's record saying, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now, we would see there that the exact thing that the Lord Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching and performing miracles among the people of Israel would be the gospel of the kingdom. This would show us how this is in a different setting and dispensation when it comes to our dispensation of grace today. Because in the time when the Sermon on the Mount is given, when the Lord Jesus was on the earth, He was offering the kingdom to the people of Israel. For that very reason, if you would explore the word, the content of the gospel of the kingdom, you would discover that it's all about the kingdom of heaven is nigh. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. We have to understand that the word gospel is not a generality. The word gospel, being a good news, would only make sense if there is a content of the good news. When Christ preached the gospel of the kingdom, He's declaring to all Israel that the kingdom of God is at hand because the king was there and the kingdom is being offered. That is exactly what the Lord Jesus had been preaching in all the synagogues, healing all manners of sickness and all diseases among the people. Now we would understand that and this would set the this would give us a good understanding of what the Lord Jesus is actually laying fold in the Gospels. Now, we would read also that the Lord Jesus is talking to the multitudes of Israel. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 25, we would see there, And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Now, we would see that the Lord Jesus was speaking to the multitudes of Israel in general, but he would be specific, speaking specifically to his disciples in particular. 
Now, we would say that this is rightly so because the Lord Jesus was a minister of the circumcision. We could read that in Romans chapter 15, verse number 8, where Paul writes, Now, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now, the Lord Jesus, as the confirmation of the promises made to the fathers, in Galatians 3, 8, we would see what that promise is. Now, we would see. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Right there, you would see once again that the gospel is only determined by its content. If the gospel of the kingdom is about the kingdom of heaven is at hand, then the gospel that was preached to Abraham is the promise that in thee shall all nations be blessed. That is what Abraham believed and it was counted unto him as righteousness. That makes it unique and distinct from the gospel that was preached by the Apostle Paul who declared how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom, is declaring that the Christ has come and the kingdom of God is at hand. The gospel preached to Abraham is that in Abraham shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Now, because Jesus is the confirmation of the promises made unto the fathers, we would see that Jesus Christ is the final revelation. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, we read these words, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, right there you would see that it was God who was speaking unto the fathers by the prophets. There is God and there is a spokesperson, that's the prophets. There's an audience which is unto the fathers and you would see that God at sundry times and diverse manners spake. You see, this shows us that God had communicated His will. God has dealt differently in different times through different spokespersons to different audiences. But in particular, in one dispensational uh, continuation, we see that hath in these last days spoken unto us. And do you remember the word us there would go back to Hebrews. You see, spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, Jesus Christ is God's final revelation. And not only that, the Lord Jesus is also the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Now, we would read that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 18, where the Lord Jesus claims, saying, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. For this very reason, because the Lord Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and God's final revelation to Israel and the world, the Lord Jesus can, was asked the question in Matthew 19, verse number 16, where he was asked, What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, how did Christ answer that? We would read Christ's answer to that in Matthew chapter 19, verse number 17, where the Lord Jesus says, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Simple, that's simply a straightforward question. How do I, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Christ says, keep 
the commandments. Unless you would misconstrue what commandments are being talked about, the Lord Jesus clarified in Matthew chapter 19, verse 18 to 19, we would read these words. He said unto him, which, Jesus said, thou shalt not do mo no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is clearly the commandments of the Old Testament law and of the Mosaic law. So here we see a follow-up question in Matthew chapter 19, verse number 20, where we read these words. The young man said unto him, All these pertaining to the entirety of the Mosaic law have I kept from my youth, youth up. What lack I yet? Now, right at this very point is the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Do remember that the scribes and the Pharisees were very legalistic to obey every jot and tittle of the law. That's why we asked the question a while ago, what is the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees? Now, we have seen that Christ upholds righteousness and justification by the law. We would read that in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 19, where we read these words. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, here's the statement in question. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, the Lord Jesus says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now the Pharisees and the scribes were righteous by the law. That would be that would have been enough to make one righteous in the time before Christ. Because we would read that the law before Christ was enough to make Israel righteous. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 25, Moses writes, And it shall be our righteousness. Now, how do we get that right? How do they get the righteousness? Moses says, If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Now, we would say that the law was able before Christ to make one righteous, to make Israel righteous because that's God's word. But we also say that the law was made to point to Christ who is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That is why we also say that the law points to Christ. Moses says so in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where Moses writes, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. So what's the picture? The law and the prophets will be fulfilled by the prophet whom God would raise in their midst. And when God does that, Moses gives this commandment in the law. Unto him ye shall hearken. So the law points to Christ according to Moses. And the law points to Christ also according to Paul as a witness, saying in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, the righteousness of the law was no longer enough Enough, after the time that Christ came. Why? Because the prophet that's already come, the law and the prophets culminates in him and he fulfills the law and the prophets. When Christ is present, Israel ought to hearken to him. 
for this very reason, we would read the young man, say in Matthew chapter 19 verse 20, The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? The man had a deep sense that he is missing something. The man has a deep longing and a deep idea that though he kept the law from his youth up, yet he lacks something. Because the law was a shadow of good things to come. It was supposed to be fulfilled to Jesus Christ and it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the man, keeping the whole law, asks, What lack I yet? And for this reason, we would see the Lord's answer in Matthew chapter 19, verse number 21, where the Lord says, Then Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect. Now that complements his question, What do I lack? So Christ says, this is what you lack. If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Now notice the colon there. And Christ gives this command, And come and follow me. We would see here that the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees Righteousness that brings Israel in the time of Christ to perfection is simply the righteousness that Israel gains by following their Christ as he teaches the law. Now we would see that this is the righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees, the scribes and Pharisees, because this is the law as taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for this reason, we would read how Christ perfects the law as we will read Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, where Christ says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So we would see there the perfecting the command, Thou shalt not kill. Now, we can read the very same commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 13, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 17. Now, how did Christ perfect this command? Now, we would read verse 22 of Matthew chapter 5, where the Lord Jesus says, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So we would see there that it's not just the act of killing, but it's anger with your brother without cause and cursing your brother. Now on a side note, if you're not using the King James Bible, can I ask you, to look at your Bibles and see how it is rendered in this phrase, angry with his brother without cause. Now do take your Bibles, but if, for your benefit, here are some popular Bible versions that render this first part of this passage of Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Now, do take a while to consider what the modern versions wrote. Now, these are but a few of the many translations, and these are basically the more popular ones. Now, do take time to consider what are they saying. Okay? So, the New International Version says, But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Now, I will only read the New International Version. You may check your favorite version there. Maybe you are an English Standard Version user or a New American Standard Bible user or maybe the newer Legacy Standard Bible. 
listen, uh, look at those passages carefully and compare. Are there differences? Yes, of course. Obviously, there are some differences between the translation, but essentially they're saying the same thing. That anyone who is angry with a brother is liable or subject to judgment. Now, let me put the King James Bible side by side with those modern Bibles. Now, I want you to observe carefully what is written in the King James Bible, comparing what has been said in the versions above and how it is differently stated in the King James Bible. Now, let me read to you the King James Bible that says, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So, I pray that you would notice the difference, but is it glaring? I hope that you would see that the difference is the phrase without a cause. Now, you may go all textual criticism on me and argue that the Nestle Allen Greek text and the oldest and best manuscripts don't contain the Greek word aiki, but I would also argue with you back that the text receptus line of the Greek text, like the Stephanus, Scrivener, and Byzantine, all have that word. Now we would go around and around with all scholar with all these questions and scholarship. But I want us to ask and settle this simple question. Does, the, does your Bible make Jesus Christ subject to judgment? If you would go back to what we have shown a while ago, all the versions, all the modern versions say that it is uh, the, to that one who is angry with the brother is subject to judgment but the king james bible says that the one who is angry with his brother without a cause is the one subject to judgment so does your bible make jesus christ subject to judgment and maybe you're thinking how is that connected because let me show you in mark chapter 3 verse number 5 that the lord jesus also got angry with his brothers, his fellow Israelites, for that fact. Now, this passage is Christ's healing during the Sabbath day. Actually, this is like a setup. When they came in, they were watching if Jesus Christ will do a miracle of healing in the Sabbath. So, this is the context in which this was spoken. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, we would read these words. And when he had looked round about on them with anger. Did Jesus Christ get angry? Yes! But was there a cause? We would read these words. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. And he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored whole as the other. Now here's the truth. The Lord Jesus got angry, but with a cause. Now, if the modern versions were right, and they are not, then the Lord Jesus is guilty of his own words and is subject to judgment. Now, maybe you're saying that's nitpicking. No, that's plain truth. Now, if Christ is subject to judgment in trespass of his own words, then Jesus Christ is not sinless. Are you not moved by the gravity of such an error? There's no, no amount of scholarship, no amount of any textual evidence that would suffice in the ramification that affects when you make Jesus Christ subject to judgment. But here's the worst thing. If Jesus Christ Christ is not sinless, then these scriptures cannot be true. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. If Christ was 
liable to judgment. And Christ was a trespasser of his own words, a transgressor of his own words. Then he knew sin. Then this verse could not be true. And if it's not true, then how can we made, be made the righteousness of God in him? This verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If Jesus Christ is a sinner, then the scriptures are not true. And we are in our sins. And much worse, if Christ knew sin, and he was not made sin for us, then this verse is also not true. That Jesus Christ, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. It's not true. Because it was for His offense that He was delivered, not for ours. You see? And if that is not true, if Jesus Christ is not sinless, then this verse could also not be true. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4, the Apostle Paul declares, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures how can that be true if christ is not sinless and if christ is proven by his own words to be a transgressor then we have no gospel of our salvation but what's the point of this discussion, my friends? This dispels the lie that all Bibles are saying the same. Because obviously, there are Bibles that make Christ a sinner and subject to judgment, therefore invalidating the truth of the gospel that Christ died for our sins, not His, was buried and rose again the third day. You see? My friends, this is quite subtle, but we ought to be very, very careful. Now, going back to our passage, Christ perfects the law and the prophets by showing God's way to truly keep the commandment, thou shalt not kill. And we would read Christ's counsel in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 to 26, where we read these words. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar... And thou rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Now, killing someone is not only in the act itself, but Christ shows that it's even in anger without a cause against and cursing another. Therefore, Christ calls each one to be quick to reconcile and agree with their brother lest they face judgment. Now, we would see a pattern here. First, Jesus Christ came not to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. Now, it is by the fulfillment of the law and the prophets that Christ can say to a man who was already keeping the commandments to be perfect by following him. Because the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees is the righteousness that Israel gains by following their Christ as it teaches the law. And in these ways, Christ perfects the commandments as it teaches them to Israel as God intended them to be kept. So, for next week's study, 
We're going to look at perfecting the command, Thou shalt not commit adultery in verses 27 to 30. Perfecting the law of divorce in verses 31 to 32. Perfecting the commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain in verses 33 to 37. We would see perfecting the commandment regarding just recompense in verse 38 to 42. And perfecting the commandment, Love thy neighbor in verses 43 to verse 47. Tonight, we will stop there for the meantime. And if the law is said to be so high, we would see that for us the Gentiles in this dispensation of grace, it would actually be impossible to keep. Let me show you from Romans chapter 3, verse number 90. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. I want you to take this point. Remember, to whom the law was given. Because the law was spoken the law was said to them who are under the law. So to whom was the law spoken? Let me show you from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 44 to 45 that says, And this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel. These are the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which Moses spake unto the children of Israel, after they came forth out of Egypt. Simply put, the law was given to Israel, God's chosen people. And if God's chosen people could not keep the law, what's the hope of Gentiles to whom the law was not spoken to begin with? What's the hope of Gentiles to keep the law? For this very reason, we would read back in our passage in Romans chapter 3, of a righteousness without the law. Let me show you from Romans chapter 3, verse 20 to 23, where the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For, this, for that very reason, it's impossible to be justified by the law in this dispensation of grace. If you would bring your people back to the law, it would lead them to perdition because it is written, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. How would that be? We would say, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. My friends, the truth is, the law makes us guilty before God. But God gives us His righteousness without the law, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. And because it is by the faith of Jesus Christ, we would also see that this righteousness is by the finished work of Jesus Christ. As we would read in Romans chapter 3, verse 24 to 26, that says, Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Because salvation, because justification and righteousness is not by our works nor of the works of the law, but by the faith and the finished work of Christ, here is the simplicity of the gospel that we preach. We declare Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again for our justification. The work for our righteousness and justification had already been accomplished 
fully by the finished work of Jesus Christ. The question remains is whether you would trust that this finished work, his death for your sins, burial and resurrection is sufficient to save you eternally, forgive you all trespasses, and justify you absolutely from all things. And know that the righteousness for us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace is not a righteousness by the law. But as we would read these words in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, that the, the righteousness which is of God by faith. In the Lord Jesus' time and in their dispensation, Israel gets a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees by following their Christ. But for us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace, we have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, not of the law, but which is through faith, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. By that we see, that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Our prayer for you tonight is that you would see that the righteousness that is given to us Gentiles is not of the law, but by the faith, through the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the righteousness of God by faith. And you can only avail it by trusting the sufficiency of the finished work of Jesus Christ in his death for our sins, burial, and resurrection for our justification. We pray that you would consider these truths tonight and let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the faith in the finished work of Christ had availed for us a justification that is without the law. We thank you, Father, that we can simply trust the sufficiency of this finished work and we have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And may the truths that we receive from your word this evening, let it simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in our future broadcast on Monday. We pray that we could resume the broadcast of the, of the uh, precepts from the Proverbs on Thursday. We pray that we would do a broadcast again of the Pauline Pastorate Online Bible Studies on the book of First Timothy. And next week, let's go back to the part three of what is the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you.